In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a painting by Pierre Pouvy de Chavannes, entitled The Beheading of John the Baptist. While of rather obscure popularity, Pierre Pouvy was a remarkable large-scale painter of his time, with his artworks continuing to adorn the Hotel de Ville, the Sabon, and the Pantheon in Paris. His works influenced painters like Gauguin and Matisse. His works demonstrate an allegorical style of influence, with a sense of harmony and alluding to a timeless Arcadian world. The painting, this painting, is a good example of this. Pierre Pouvy portrays the moment of execution with the blade in movement. In the centre is a realistic portrayal of a young haloed John the Baptist. Like Jesus, John dies relatively young in his early thirties. John has his arms and palms displayed before him, reminiscent of other portrayals of Christ in the resurrection, displaying the wounds he received in the crucifixion. This aptly displays the foreshadowing in Mark's Gospel that surrounds John the Baptist's death. If this has befallen the last of the prophets, what will happen to the promised Messiah. Our Gospel reading today from Mark has all the things that, tragically, sell newspapers. It's got scandal, it's got sex, it's got violence and intrigue, along with a good showcase of dancing. This macabre little story features in the middle of Jesus sending out his disciples in pairs to spread the good news of God's kingdom and to do the kinds of miraculous healings that Jesus has been doing as signs of that kingdom. After we hear of the death of John the Baptist, the disciples return from this mission to Jesus. This story we hear today is a story within a story within the Gospel story. Several scholars think that this inclusion of a story whose drama seems to have already taken place is a deliberate device to give the sense of time passing between the disciples going out and then them returning. It's a sort of intermission. The storytelling starts with fear. Herod hears about Jesus and is instantly afraid that the man he has killed, Jesus' cousin, John, has come back from the dead. Fear seems to surround the events that lead up to the death of the baptizer. In the account of the Jewish historian Josephus, Herod arrests John because of fear. In this account, Josephus's account, Herod was so afraid of the devotion of those following John the Baptist and of his eloquence that he was afraid John could command the Jewish population to overthrow him. Herod Antipas's grip on power was tenuous at best and was really only and he was really only in control because of Roman backing. His, uh, the, the, the Gospels, however, speak of different motivations. In the Gospel accounts, John is arrested because he has been speaking out. John criticises that John has married his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and convicts them of adultery. So whereas the historian looks to political intrigue, 
and might against right, the gospel writers look to a deeper, look deeper to a moral challenge and the stamping out of those who would speak truth to power. The bizarre and tawdry story of John's execution involves a number of players. Herod, the puppet ruler of Galilee, Herodias, his wife, as well as, as, well as his brother's divorcee, Herodias's daughter, the members of the royal court, and John the baptizer, who never sets foot on the stage, except when he's brought in on a platter. Herodias is out for revenge. Herod's motivations are unclear, but are often put down as lust for his stepdaughter. The girl, named Salome, as some may be familiar with the Oscar Wilde play, her motivations are unclear, but she is clearly in cahoots with Mummy. After all, she could have asked for anything. But the unnamed party that is perhaps equally complicit with the injustice and violence to be committed, equally guilty, perhaps, are all the other people at the party who say nothing and do nothing to stop what unfolds. I don't think you can read this story and not feel the concern for the cold political machinations the rampant injustice and tyranny and the disregard for human life on display. This is equally applicable to our own world and even within our own country today. This story is perhaps particularly apt as we come to the end of NADOC week in Australia. For the sake of not losing face in front of his guests, Herod commits an atrocious act and agrees to the disgusting request. Regardless of the vindictive machinations of mother and daughter, Herod could have disagreed. Herod could have refused. But like the reference in our Gospel reading last Sunday, Herod loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. Within its context here in the narrative, John's important example serves as a reminder of the cost of discipleship. The story of the death of the baptizer told as the disciples go out to spread the good news prefigures not only the story of Jesus' death which is to come but the stories of all those who come after, who would follow Christ, who would take up their cross and follow him. Mark underlines the fact that what we are sent out to do is dangerous and that discipleship is costly. If we are to be faithful disciples of Jesus, then we are disciples whether this takes us to places of admiration or opposition or rejection or even the real possibility of martyrdom. Or else we are but the fair weather friends of God. Let us never forget that across the world Many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are being abused, arrested, imprisoned, tortured, and even killed, simply because they are Christians. This is happening all around the world, all the time. We just don't often hear about it or talk about it. The death of John the Baptizer shows us that there are forces that cannot stand to hear the truth and will do anything to blot it out, even if that means that people suffer and die. 
the account of the death of John the Baptist within its placing within the Gospels, I think, really challenges the reader, challenges Christians, to ask by what standards and by whose standards are we living our lives? Are we more interested in pleasing others or keeping them or ourselves comfortable? Or are we willing to be and be known as Christ's disciples in every place, time and circumstance? Let our words in those moments echo those of the martyrs of the early church whose simple, plain confession of faith unyielding to the violent forces that often went against them, was, I am a Christian. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.